Deputy Chief Elections Officer Roxanne Myers was not required to plead to the charges, which state that between March 4th to March 14th, while being a public officer, she willfully misconduct herself together with Claremont Mingo and others to declare a fraudulent account of votes for general elections amounting to a breach of the public's trust without any reasonable excuse or justification. The second charge is basically the same but refers to the regional elections. The state prosecutor Tariq Mohammed objected to bail based on the seriousness of the offenses and the failure by the police to make contact with her for over a month in relation to the investigation. The Chief Magistrate Anne McLennan, however, granted bail in the sum of 150000 on each count. Myers has to return on October 23rd. She was represented by attorneys Nigel Hughes and Ronald Daniels. Daniels spoke with the media outside the courts on Friday. She was granted bail in the sum of $150,000 on each count, so that would be a total of $300,000. Um, now, the, the prosecutor objected to bail quite naturally, as expected. And the prosecutor objected to bail based on the seriousness of the, um, the offence, which is a rather standard objection, saying that Ms. Myers uh, was attempting, um, for want of a better expression, to undermine uh, our country's democracy. The prosecutor, as one of the basis for objections, also indicated that uh, the police have been making feverish attempts to contact Ms. Myers. The Ghana police force had said Myers turned herself in on Tuesday last, following over a month during which several efforts were made by the police to contact her even at her place of work in relation to the post-March 2, 2020 elections incidents. However, Daniels told reporters that Myers was asked no questions about her alleged role in attempting to commit electoral fraud while she was in police custody. Myers was kept in police custody up until her arraignment at court Friday. During the interview conducted or with Ms. Myers by the officers who have conducted the investigations, no question was asked of Ms. Myers uh, pointing towards her participation or role in the conduct of these elections. Nothing uh, was put to Myers, uh, Ms. Myers to the effect that uh, she had conducted herself inappropriately during the conduct of uh, these uh, elections. Would have there been any witness statements to, to bolster these charges? There haven't been any witness statements. The prosecution has indicated to the court that they have not completed investigations. The prosecution invited the court to have them return in two weeks. The Ghana Police Force in August announced that a comprehensive investigation was launched into allegations of criminal conduct by GCOM officials in relation to the March 2nd polls and the events that followed. The Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield and Returning Officer of Region 4, Claremont Mingo, were already arrested and charged in relation to the probe. Lowenfield and Mingo are already facing criminal charges in the Georgetown Magistrates Court relating to fraud, misconduct in office and breach of the public's trust by providing results of the March 2nd elections known to be false. Lowenfield also appeared in court on Friday and his attorney, senior counsel, Neil Boston, spoke with reporters outside of the court. Well, today is not, wasn't a day fixed for trial. It was for further disclosure where the prosecution would have laid over statements of witnesses that they wish to call to establish the charge against Logan Field. But they were not up to it today. They never made any disclosure. All they keep saying that the DPP has made up our mind to do what? We do not know. The DPP has not written to them setting out what she has in mind, but they are of the view that she may do so by the next disclosure date. I think it's politically directed. The whole idea behind these charges is to remove low in field from GCO. That is only a question of time. If the DPP takes over, we will see interdiction pending the hearing and determination of the matter. 
The charges against Lowenfield were filed on June 30 by People's Progressive Party member Desmond Morian and member of the new movement Daniel Josh Kanai. The trial in relation to the charges filed by Morian will start on November 13, while the charges filed by Kanai will begin on November 20. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo. I am advised from an article appearing in the press from a commission of the Elections Commission that the Crime Chief, Mr. Blanham, had written to the Chairman of the Elections Commission requesting certain documents from the Commission, which documents are under the jurisdiction of the Chief Elections Officer. And it appears that upon that communication, documents were released to the police. It is no wonder that the Chairman of the Elections Commission has not raised her voice in concern for the welfare of these officers who worked under her. The only conclusion one can arrive at is that the Chairman is complicit with respect to the dismantling of the cop by the PPP. Madam Chairman, you are leaving a tattered legacy and you should do something before it gets worse.
Michael Ford of Luke Avenue, Dayville, St. Michael in Barbados, appeared at the Georgetown Magistrate Court on Friday before Chief Magistrate Anne McLennan. Ford pleaded guilty and did not give any explanation to the court. The three other men who appeared in court were hard at Monilal of Charlotte Street, Board of Georgetown, Trevor Robinson of First Avenue, Torps, St. James, Barbados, and Randy Welch. They were all released and the charges were dropped against them. The two others who were arrested... James M. Todd and Clyde Outridge did not appear in court. The offense read that the defendants on October 7, 2020, trafficked 150 pounds of cannabis. Prosecutor of the Customs Anti-Narcotics Unit, Kanu, Konyo Sandiford, said Welch was charged separately for aiding and abetting trafficking, while Monilal and Robinson were charged for trafficking. Ranks of Kanu on Wednesday interdicted a Barbados cargo vessel at the Ghana National Shipping Corporation wharf with a bulk of marijuana destined for Barbados. The Barbados registered cargo vessel marked CV1 Barbados was laden with perishables such as vegetables, plantains, coconuts and pumpkins and other goods. Kanu in a statement said the vessel was searched twice this week as part of an ongoing operation. The first time was October 6 and then a second search was done on October 7, 2020. It was on the second search that 71 large bulk parcels of marijuana weighing 150 pounds were uncovered, concealed in a section of the vessel. The vessel is believed to have been in Guyana for several weeks and had undergone repairs whilst docked here. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isinella Patwo. First, I do want to ask you what you're doing back in Guyana because it, uh, you did all your farewell yes. visits and so on. Do you know how long you'll be here for? Um, uh, 
Right, so shortly before you did all of those, uh, all the farewell visits and so on, of course, uh, we had the elections yes. and there, there was a transition yes. uh, finally. Uh, I, I wondered what the uh, UK's thinking was um, after that process happened. Uh, and of course, you had said that that was critical uh, if the UK were to continue to have its development cooperation with uh, Guyana. But you'd also threatened that there would be sanctions against yeah. um, persons. What has happened to that? I, I do want to ask you about that. Uh, could you explain what would be the scope of that? Uh, I know you're building the 125 kilometer road from uh, what, Linden to uh, Kapakari. Right. Uh, what sort of funding are we talking about? Uh, and is there a time period when funding expires? Uh, Uh, what's the scope of that uh, Kingston to Ogle project? W what is the idea there? Thank you. 
That was the reality. So they had to look for the next most. Um, the next. And Dr. Boyle is on a contract. She was out of the system, was brought back in, and offered a contract. So the appointment comes through the next most senior public service appointee, who is Dr. Singh, who had served for many years. He actually took over from me in Region 1. He's from the University of Ghana Medical School. Incidentally, I see a lot of, um, you know, very uh, inaccurate um, postings that are going around about um, Dr. Singh's qualifications and so on. But he's a graduate of the University of Guyana Medical School mm -hmm. and um, has distinguished himself, himself in that he served at, uh, not only in Region 1, but he was the medical superintendent at Saudi Hospital for many, many years. He came to the ministry, served in the capacity as the director of the blood bank for a period of time, then went on to regional health services, which is like our second most senior position at the ministry itself, um, serving there as a director for several years before opting to um, complete his specialization in obstetrics and gynecology, and has been a driver in many ways of a lot of public health initiatives. You know, from my own um, working with him, he had worked in um, the Miracle Vision program, he had helped with the expansion when we, when we had the uh, initial programs to develop the um, diagnostic centers with the Cubans, um, expanding a lot of the um, training programs, especially in obstetrics, maternal care, contraceptive, and is still one of the lead trainers in the alarm program and with the um, implants, the contraceptive implants. So, he has distinguished himself in his own so way. So that you think it was fear and not the why was Well, different. that was the, I, I, I doubt it. And, you know, the, the, this is a national, this is not anything about politics. This is the way how the structure of the public services. The Chinese ambassador to Guyana said he contacted the Chinese community for assistance in procuring a machine that will fast-track the testing of COVID-19 after discussions with the health minister, Dr. Frank Antony. The machine is called an extractor and specifically extracts the viral genetic material. We learned that uh, there is difficulty in Guyana, especially about the machine, because now the, we have a, should get a new machine to accelerate or expedite the process. The new machine could reduce time from nine hours to two hours. That means really we need this machine. Thanks to the leadership of minister. The health minister expresses appreciation for the donation. So we would be able to do at least 96 samples within uh, two to three hours. And that would be a remarkable achievement, which means that we can run uh, even more batches during an eight-hour shift. Uh, so we are very, very uh, grateful to the government of China. The Chinese government also sent medical specialists to assist with the installation and training of how to use the machine, as well as specialists to assist with Guyana's COVID-19 fight. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo.
husband and I are great coffee lovers and we were on a quest to find good coffee in Guyana, which was a challenge. We couldn't find any. It was all instant coffee and um, we really missed having good coffee, having lived in New York for a while and enjoying gourmet coffee. And um, so, we, I mean, we used to beg friends and family coming from overseas to give, bring us a pound of coffee beans so we could enjoy. And then we decided, you know, let's do something about it. Let's create something where other people can come and enjoy it as much as, you know, we will. And I mean, there was, uh, back in those days, there were no um, coffee houses. So we really introduced the coffee culture here in Guyana. And it took off immediately. We wanted to create um, a cozy space, a nice atmosphere where people can come in, have their coffee, relax, you know, read a book. We have a little room with some books that we offer customers. And I hear the laughter of my customers and how happy and content they are. And, you know, there's a sense of community and a sense of belonging and you would see they're happy, they're comfortable, and that to me is the ultimate reward for all this. In fact, we were closed for about two and a half months. Um, and that was really hard, you know, I mean, it's not just Guyana is the entire world and so everybody had to learn to cope and adopt and we when when it was okay for us to start again um, and we opened it was a little difficult because people had to line up outside and so on um, but you know everyone's been great and in adhering to rules and regulations and, and guidelines and we try our best to sanitize and to um, make sure customers feel safe. I want them to be totally satisfied and know that they got what they came in for and it makes them feel good. And, and hopefully that can improve their day, you know, and um, so customer satisfaction is what I want. I, I'm a person. I'm, I'm not. I'm never ever satisfied. You know, I can't say, well, oh, I'm happy to go. I, I still, you know, follow things as they go along. I'm still, you know, engaged in what it is. I participate a lot in some. Now that we have all the virtual meetings and so on, give my inputs. And my um, my directors who have come to really trust and work closely with, they still we still bounce things off and you know they share ideas and things like that. I work very closely with the with all of the um, seven programs in the ministry. Uh, I think the you know the, the relationship still continues. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I stand ready <laughs> if that is the case um, to give whatever service I can. What is next for you? Uh, I, I, I need to get a few things in terms of personal life organized. I, you know, focus a little bit on family and some personal issue. But um, I still want to, you know, give whatever service I can, even if it means a bit of practice too. I, I'm toying with that idea also. <laughs> Maybe get back into, um, you know, some um, 
patient care and, and see how that works. I think service was really just the thing that really was important to me. Um, I don't know if there is a, you know, a trumpet I can blow. Or you don't um, want to blow your own trumpet. Well, it's left up for that. A lot of persons, you know, on hearing of my retirement, I've had a lot of people coming out to say, oh, you're a caring doctor, you've been a good doctor. For those who I've seen as patients, you know, um, of course, for the last 13 years or so, I was not in active practice. So people are referring to that period prior to then. Uh, you know, if, if filaria is still a pretty much neglected disease, but that one still stands out as one of my favorites. You know, um, going around when I started that program, I recall um, visiting with persons in the various regions and going to their homes, you know, people who are afraid to even come to health facilities. And, you know, you see the suffering and the, the uh, embarrassment, the, the shame sometimes that some people have. They didn't even want to lift up their skirts or raise their trousers for you to see their leg. Um, and, you know, it was smelly and they had all these lesions. So those kinds of things was really hard to, to, to really come to grips with, to see how people suffer silently um, for simple things that you could actually do something about. Mm -hmm. So um, those were, I think, my best moments. <laughs> the, um, reasonable, I, I would say, you might have to ask uh, the ministers I served with. I think it's about nine and all. Um, from, from uh, I think, way back to, um, Mr. Hamilton Green probably was my first minister <laughs> when I was just starting um, in the career of, of being a doctor and moving through uh, Minister Teixeira, Minister Henry Jeffrey, uh, you know. <laughs> Without getting into any specific, could you recall any sort of conflict or pushback between <sighs> your political yeah. um, bosses and what you knew as a doctor? Well, at that times, you know, they were they were they were different focuses, and um, you know, as as CMO, you always had to bring a balance. Um, what I strive to do always um, was to try to provide as far as possible the most accurate mm -hmm. and um, reliable information to all ministers whoever I worked with. Um, sometimes it was accepted, sometimes it wasn't. I, I recall, you know, when we when we had a, a spat of. Uh, very high levels of maternal deaths, uh, somewhere about 2012 or thereabouts. You know, we became, it was intense pressure. You know, it was difficult economic times. They had family, children were uh, ready for school and so on. So I did practice intermittently, but I never left the service. You know, I always seek and obtain permission, um, held a little clinic. Um, um, but I, I always tell steadfastly, um, you know, give my service to the nation. It was tough, and um, you know, I have three children now, and two older ones. My daughter actually just finished um, ther uh, physical medicine physiotherapy, and she's back with Georgetown Hospital actually, working in the COVID unit. Um, my second is a boy, and he has completed his, um, well, part of his pilot program, he's still trying to get himself in order and I have a younger one. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm divorced, but uh, nevertheless, we continue to, um, you know, care for our children and um, two of them still live with me, actually. <laughs> On Sunday, we will be hosting a virtual girls' rally to commemorate International Day of the Girl Child. It's a very important event in the ministry, and this one on Sunday is our flagship event where 
because of the nature of the discussion, I didn't think that we should not engage young women from across the country. So this platform gives us the unique opportunity, me in particular, to interface with girls from all of the regions. And we will be having frank discussions in various issues that young women are grappling with, including teenage pregnancy, violence, stereotyping, body shaming, to name a few, and also with their help coming up with recommendations and suggestions and how they would like to see their world better and how the ministry can, in a focused way, target some of the areas they will raise as well as look at some of their perspective on how they want these issues addressed. So in addition to that, while we chat candidly with those from across the region, we will have the opportunity to have others express their, themselves in various artistic and creative ways. So it's a conversation as well as entertainment all rolled into one, as there will be performances from many young women as well as female groups from across the country in areas of music and dance, singing, drama, poetry, just to name a few. And we will also utilize the opportunity to share with Guyana some of the messages that we received from young people across the country. The ministry in leading up to this rally would have had a few competitions and activities geared towards the young person. There was a competition on bookmarks where we encourage young people to send in an artistically decorated bookmark with a message that they would like the rest of the country to have a look at, as well as give us the opportunity to place our information on the bookmark. That comp competition period has come to an end, so we will be featuring some of the entries that we got from that competition. And there was another innovation that we engaged in where we encouraged young women between the ages of 9 and 14 and 15 to 25 to share video messages, 45 second to one minute video messages on key areas, their perspective and how they feel that they would have broken barriers in their particular environments because the theme this year is encouraging young people to break barriers, young people to have platforms or find their voices and young women to really explore their potential. So it's a very important one. It's the 2020 year of International Day of the Girl Child and we thought it would be very productive to engage them in all of these different ways. We're happy with the responses that we got and currently we are working to not only have these one-off programs but to have more sustained engagement with the young women in particular because i had the opportunity to interface with them a little bit yesterday to prep for the event and i think they're all very passionate about specific things in their communities whether it's in the hinterland or in the villages from which they are from Today we are having a continuation of our eighth blood drive. We normally do this um, once per year at the Wall Street branch and it is done in collaboration with the blood bank, right? We um, are having our staff members alone participate in this event and we thought it fitting to do it today because um, as a bank we are celebrating Pink Friday which collaborates with the Cancer Awareness Month, October. So that's what we're doing today. This is an a annual something that we do with GBTI and we look forward to having the staff um, participate. Look, uh, sorry, a full <laughs> participation of um, the staff here uh, with us. So thank you on behalf of the National Blood Transfusion Service for the upliftment of uh, the medical healthcare, I should say, in Guyana. So we thank you, we thank your management, your staff, for such a venture. What we have found that there were declined in blood donation, and a lot of organizations have 
ceased on their blood drive. But now what we've found is that they're, you know, they're more aware of what is happening. I think they know a bit more about the pandemic and they're allowing their staff to have, to donate blood. So um, we thank you, the organizations who have um, thought about the patients in the hospital and those who really need that blood. So, um, you know, with the pandemic out, I know you will be afraid, but don't be afraid. We sanitize after every donor leave that um, the chair, and we make sure that you are safe because we want to protect you as well as your family, mm -hmm. as well as we like for you to protect us and our family. So International Day of the Girl Child will be celebrated on Sunday, October 11th, amplifying the voices and rights of girls everywhere. According to the UN, the theme for this year, My Voice, Our Equal Future, reimagines a better world inspired and led by adolescent girls as part of the global generation equality movement. Girls worldwide are demanding a life free from gender-based violence, access to health, skills, recognition, and investment as leaders of social change. I'm joined today by a young lady who has been using sport to chart her career path, 18-year-old national badminton standout, Priyana Ramdani, who is currently on scholarship in Canada. Priyana, thank you very much for talking to us today. But uh, before we get into the actual conversation, I know you're in lockdown in Canada, something different yeah. from, from what you're accustomed to here when you were here playing sport in Guyana. How have you been coping with that new lifestyle? Well, it's been very different. Like, Everything has completely changed up. We haven't been able to play for seven months. And I've never played, stayed away from badminton that long. Yeah. So we've been doing like in the house exercises. Yeah. And whenever we can, we jog around the community or the park. But now, like three weeks ago, the college has opened back his gym so i've been able to train now which is so much better because yeah. but i feel a little bit rusty going back but i think i'll be better in like a month or two <laughs> right that, that must have been difficult though knowing that you've played badminton for all these years almost yeah. all your life you know and, and to be away yep. from the game that must be disheartening huh? yeah it was hard for me like I mean, for all athletes, I mean, coping towards that because it's a complete different thing not being able to play your sport for a while. <laughs> I'm sure you would have learned a, a, a few things about yourself during this period, though. Yeah, well, I've gotten mentally stronger for yeah. sure because, like, not being able to find the motivation to exercise at home was really hard for me because, like, I tried my best. And my coach was here, who is also my father, and he used to push me and my brother to, like, go take a jog or something. <laughs> yeah. All right, to the topic now of International Day of the Girl Child. I know you, you have blazed the trail in badminton, really, wearing national colors from a very early age, representing Guyana <laughs> with, with distinction. Tell us a bit about that journey and, and how it has helped to shape the person that you are today. Well, badminton is almost my entire life. And everyone noticed, like, Without badminton, I don't think I would be the person I am today. And it's all because of sport. Sport helped shape the person I am today towards discipline, being on time, and yeah. everything else. Like, sport does a lot to a person, even help with manners and everything. Like, I think, like, everyone should be involved in a sport because, like, being coached towards a specific goal helps uh, build up an individual really well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, sportsmen and women over time have often said that, um, you know, success on the field or on the court uh, doesn't happen by coincidence. You know, it's all about hard work, uh, dedication, yeah. commitment, and having that support network. Um, how, how crucial is that last element, having that support network? I know your family has been behind you all the while. Yeah. So, like, not everyone will have their family behind yeah. them. But personally, for me, my family have been behind me for my entire life which I appreciate because, like, not everyone can have that. My dad brought me up in the sport. My mom helped coach, like, my entire life. And I think without them, I wouldn't be here like, the way I am, like, competing in the national tournaments and stuff. And I've come up far away because of them. And also my 
met my um, Bamton Club members. They've also helped me as well. And I just want to thank everyone for helping me to be where I am right now. <laughs> so in um in, in a Guyana context, you know, we, we have not seen that rush in the, in a number of um, young girls gravitating yeah. towards sport. Um, if, if they do, a really small percentage of them would go on to, to represent the country or play competitively at the senior level. Um, do you think that there is scope and a space for female athletes to develop and prosper in Guyana? And, and if not, how do we change that uh, going forward? Well, right now, like, not lots of female athletes are willing to, like, participate in sport, like, in Guyana. But I think we can have more females because, like, it's not that they don't have the ability to, it's just yeah. that they don't, like, make, go towards that, you know, yeah. like, they go towards something else, yeah. right? So I think we can fix that because, like, we just need to, like, advertise sport more or start recruiting more because yeah. they don't understand the meaning of sport can really help you. And yeah. I think that the girls in sports, that they can do really well. I mean, look how many female athletes we have out there that's accomplishing really well. Yeah. And I, I would like to encourage them to like get out of her house and like particip participate in sport. Well, they can't yeah. right now. Well, but like yeah. whenever they get the chance, they can like start up and, you know. Yeah, yeah and, and you, you're a great example of, of what, what can be achieved uh, through sport and not just sport, um, academics yeah. as well. You, you've been balancing both. How has that been? Well, bouncing both, it's kind of tough sometimes, yeah. but I'm, I'm doing pretty well because, like, when we didn't have, like, coronavirus and stuff, yeah. I got to, like, catch up more in school. Um, like, well, for my entire life, I've been bouncing both. It's been really hard in secondary school because we used to have to do, like, 15 subjects and then badminton practice in the afternoon. Yeah. But I feel like I've been, like, working well with both of them together because, like, I'm doing really well in both right, right yeah. now. Yeah. I guess time management is something very significant yes. though in, in, in getting things done. Yes, I forgot that. Yes, time management <laughs> is key. Like yeah. we need to know how to balance our time. Like a yeah. first thing to do is like set a schedule or a timetable when you're like a student athlete. Yeah. All right, finally, yeah. um, you know, in your own experiences of playing competitively at, at a high level, you've played at a high level for Ghana at a very young age. Talk yeah. about the pride and the joy of, you know, being able to represent a nation that knowing that every time you step on the court, you're not only playing for yourself, that medal is not only coming to you, but you're carrying the hopes and the image of an entire yeah. country on your shoulders. Playing for my country and everyone else from there is like yeah. one of the greatest feelings because like there's not much people to represent Guyana. Yeah. And I feel as a girl, like that's a good thing to like being able to accomplish well for Guyana and other countries can see like there's something going on for Guyana and we can get up there. We just need yeah. to try harder. And I think it's great being able to wear my country colors. I mean, like our flag is one of the best looking flag in the world so yeah. <laughs> with the best looking colors. So we yeah. have good t-shirts. So I like wearing the t-shirts to play. <laughs> and you get goosebumps um, standing on the podium and hearing the, the national anthem. Yes, so I do. Well, I feel like all happy do because like being able to get a first place for your country is one, is like just one of the best feelings, knowing that you work too hard towards that goal and you finally accomplish it and it's time to move on and go forward. All right, I said finally, but one last question. Um, Priyana, <laughs> your advice to young girls, you know, I mean, at 18, you seem to, to have a, a course and a path already set in terms of what mm -hmm. you want to achieve, what you've already achieved as well. Young yeah. girls who might be struggling to find their feet to understand what they want to achieve in life. What is your advice to those young girls that might be struggling? Yeah, my advice for young girls, I would be like, we can never give up. Like, go towards your goal. Like, you... Like, people are going to go bring you down, but yeah. you can't let them bring you down. You just need to, like, continue working towards your goal, train hard, and you have to be able to have a positive mindset yeah. as well as being strong, not only physically, but mentally. Yeah. And I feel that that's very important for you to get where you are. Brianna, thank you very much for talking to us, and all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. <laughs>
On December 19, 2011, the United Nations General Assembly adopted Resolution 66170 to declare October 11 as the International Day of the Girl Child to recognize girls' rights and the unique challenges girls face around the world. International Day of the Girl Child focuses attention on the need to address the challenges girls face and to promote girls' empowerment and the fulfillment of their human rights. Tonight, Newsroom Sport showcases Guyanese girls engaging in their respective sport discipline. IPL News now, Shimron Hetmeyer starred with the baton in the field to lead Delhi Capitals to a fifth win in six games to solidify their position at the top of the IPL table. Capitals defeated Rajasthan Royals by 46 runs. Hetmeyer cracked five sixes in his 45 of 24 and Marcus Toynis belted four sixes in 39 of 30 as Delhi posted 184 for eight with Jofra Archer taking three for 24. Rajasthan then responded with 138 with Rahul Tewatia getting 38, Yeshayish Vijayishwal 34, and skipper Stephen Smith 24. Bowling for Delhi, Kagisa Rabada took 3 for 25, Ravi Chandran Ashwin 2 for 22, and Soyanis 2 for 17. Hetmeyer took three catches in the deep to complement his batting effort. Tomorrow, it's a doubleheader with Kings XI's Puncha playing Kolkata Knight Riders at 6 hours, and Chennai Super Kings coming up against Royal Challengers Bangalore at 10 hours. On Sunday, it's Sunrisers Hyderabad against Rajasthan Royals at 6 hours, and Mumbai Indians versus Delhi Capitals at 10 hours. Now, the NBA Finals could end tonight if the Los Angeles Lakers get their way against Miami Heat in Game 5. The series is poised 3-1 in favor of the Lakers, who are hunting a 17th NBA title in their first appearance in a final in 10 years. If it's anything to go by, Lakers are wearing the Kobe Bryant-designed black Mamba jersey for Game 5. They had initially intended to wear it in Game 7. Overall, the Lakers are 4-0 of this playoff when wearing the Black Mamba jerseys. Jimmy Butler and the Heat, though, would want to change history and regain the momentum and strategy that won them Game 3. The action will tip off at 21 hours and you can follow the action live on eNetworks. Now that's a wrap on sport and the news for tonight. I'm Avanash Ramzan. Have a safe weekend. See you Monday.